All right. You hear me good? All right, good afternoon, guys. Uh, my name is Andy Walton. I'm Director of Technical Sales for Serba. And today, I'm going to speak to you about uh, densifying OpenStack environments with software-defined infrastructure control, basically analytics uh, that help you scour through your cloud and virtual environments. Uh, we're going to focus, obviously, on OpenStack today. Let's see if this thing's working. Ah, there it is. All right. Let's talk about OpenStack and the enterprise. So w one of OpenStack's, something's moving around here. I'm going to have to stay close to this here. Um, one of OpenStack's biggest strengths uh, is, is KVM. Uh, it's cheaper, a better open alternative. But what we found uh, working with our customers is also uh, got some weaknesses as well. Uh, for KVM, the management ecosystem is still maturing. Uh, Solometer has been going through some major changes in terms of the sort of information that it delivers. Um, and then uh, certain challenges that we see in our customers, uh, things like VM placements, uh, density optimization, and, and making sure the environments are uh, as, as densely packed as possible. And software license containment and optimization are still big challenges. So analytics that understand the supply and the demand in these types of environments are critical. And if you go to our booth over here, uh, we're playing this game of Tetris. You've probably seen it, the big blocks and everything. Guess how many VMs are in our private cloud? So if we use that analogy here and look at the infrastructure ca capability or capacity of an existing virtual environment, what we see are workload demands are kind of like Tetris blocks. They all have different shapes and sizes depending on the time of day. And they all have certain requirements. Let's see if this works here. Uh, compute, storage, network, and software. And as each one of those workloads with different requirements actually falls down, what we find is a lot of stranded capacity. Um, a lot of spaces that you could be filling in better, and you also have some workloads that potentially might be at risk that are going above a certain policy level. So this whole Tetris analogy is, is, uh, is one that really plays well for what our software does. In order to kind of control where do those workloads land, what is the best place to put them in terms of not just utilization, but which workloads go together, which ones should be kept apart, you need a very good policy engine to actually take advantage and, and look at things like, you know, what's the, what's the optimal density of an environment? Uh, what's the performance that each of the VMs and applications needs? Uh, the availability of each, uh, of each different workload, what those things should be set at. Are the compliance rules about customer data sitting on these different uh, uh, systems and running in certain environments versus other ones? Volatility, operational cycles, monthly, yearly peaks, and then licensing considerations around the software. So if you look at, say, a production critical environment, that's going to have certain characteristics in terms of density, certain amount of availability, N plus two on the hosts, rigorous compliance of which workloads must be kept together, which ones should be kept apart host-based licensing schemes. And you think about this for production critical and then start looking at all the other different environments where you might be running things like OpenStack, KVM, production cloud, pre-prod, dev test. Every one of them is governed differently in terms of how you want to actually operate it. And it's impossible to keep control with just looking at manual levers or information that's sitting in, well, um, some of the systems today. So that really has to be governed by a very detailed uh, policy engine that can look at these things and basically dial the knobs to actually control, you know, what's your density going to be, security requirements, et cetera. So we found policy uh, inside these kinds of analytics is, is a critical component. So let's talk a little bit about supply optimization right now before we get into demand uh, optimization. And optimizing the density of these, these virtual environments. If we take a kind of very simplistic look of a KVM virtual infrastructure, different availability zones, the KVM hosts and the VMs themselves. And let's play Tetris with some of these, you know, what a typical environment might look like, as you can see, uh, somewhat fragmented, and every one of those workloads having a requirement. You have the fragmented capacity, again, potential contention risk, and inefficiencies in terms of software licenses and what's running where. Now, essentially what we do with it is playing Tetris with these workloads and using our policies to siphon through and basically let's, let's segment them together. So if you knew what the workloads looked like, if you knew what those requirements were in advance, and you could cheat at the game of Tetris, 
This is what the environment's going to look like. And what you're doing now is, is basically defragmenting the capacity and opening up a fair bit of uh, space for your workloads now to run, and also keeping some space at the top for policy, N plus one, et cetera. This results in the optimized density, software savings, lower operational risk for the workloads and the hosts themselves, and, and lower volatility overall, uh, because you're now predicting what the environment's going to look like as opposed to guessing. The way we visualize this through an OpenStack KVM console, just a simple kind of view is essentially kind of breaking it out as we get the data uh, coming in from OpenStack and the KVM hosts. Availability zones, the hosts and the guests are essentially uh, located in these rows across the spectrum. If you're sitting on the left-hand side, essentially you're at risk. So according to the policy that you have set up, any workloads, the hosts or the VMs that are sitting on the left-hand side of this environment are, don't have enough uh, resource according to the policy. It could be CPU or memory, could be I.O. issues, storage issues, what have you. Things that are sitting on the, uh, on the right hand side are wasteful. And quite often what we'll see in, in a, some of these cloud environments where users are asking for their own resources, say through the OpenStack portal, you'll see those VMs sitting on the lower right and ba uh, batched up because everyone's asking for large infrastructure more than they potentially need. And after, say, 30, 60, 90 days, you, you'll find is that they're using a fraction of that which they've asked for. And so we often see this in, in cloud and private cloud environments. And so kind of what governs the policy goalposts and where you want to be operating in the virtual environments is sitting right in the middle. So too hot, too cold, just right. A healthier environment is going to look like this. So through placement recommendations and fixing the allocations where those workloads are running, we're doing is playing Tetris with the workloads. So when you look at a healthier environment, you're going to be de-risking it as well as getting rid of a lot of the stranded capacity. Again, you can't do that by interpreting charts and metrics and things. Really what you need is, is these recommendations for changes in allocations, changes in placements in order to drive this density higher and free up this white space. So that's what a control console looks like. Another key component, I kind of brushed by it with the policy part, uh, we were talking about software license control, and this whole concept of placing the workloads in such a way that you get savings uh, when it comes to uh, analyzing things like software license models that are based on per host or per core. So if I use a really simple example here, say Windows VMs and Linux VMs, and typically what you'll see uh, across an environment is that those workloads get scattered across all the different hosts, which requires companies to typically license all those host or per core licensing models across all the infrastructure that's there. There are ways to put in containment boundaries and clusters and things. But it's typically a very difficult thing to do on an ongoing basis, and the guys who care about the savings there are typically not the guys that are actually running those environments. So the analytics as part of its algorithms can consider as well saying, perhaps what you want to do is actually minimize these licenses. So what it will do is contain those typically licenses, like things like, you know, use Microsoft DCL or Oracle or, or any kind of host or, or core-based license. And what we'll do is keep them on a certain, you know, percentage of the host-based servers. And that drives, you know, tens of thousands, in some case for some of our customers, millions of dollars of savings in their, in their virtual environments. So what you have to do is not only just shrink you know, the first time analysis, which is analyze and isolate and optimize those placements, but do it on an ongoing basis. And it's not enough just to build the uh, affinity or anti-affinity rules. The filter scheduler can be configured to work off these containment boundaries as well once established by Serba. So that is uh, one of the places where some of these rules might live longer term. We go back to this kind of drop zone diagram and, and now talk about demand optimization. So these are for new workloads coming in. We've looked at the systems as we're analyzing on a day-to-day -day basis for the hosts and the VMs and availability zones. But what about the new workloads that are coming in? And so these, these can be generated by uh, self-service requests coming in from the OpenStack portal. So a user might ask for, as an example, a new request, Red Hat OS, the Oracle database, it's got customer data on it. It needs certain tier of storage, and it should run on the West Coast. So essentially what this is is new workload demand being generated and, and customers asking for specific requirements. 
challenge today if you're doing this and you're accepting these types of requests through the cloud portal is fairly simple scheduling algorithm associated with that. There's no consideration for what's currently running in there, so you don't know, at least the, the environment doesn't know how, how hot or heavy that thing is running right now. There's no fit for purpose analytics beyond the simple filters. So understanding exactly where that should workload should run across all the different availability zones and potentially if you're running other types of hypervisors in there as well, VMware, what have you. If you add demand management in there in an intelligent routing and reservation system, so what we see is the ability to now have those types of requests come through and essentially programmatically ask Serba Serba, where do I route this workload? What's the best place for this thing to run? The analytics look at the requirements of that self-service request and match them to the amenities and the available space of those existing places where that workload can run. Think of it as like hotels.com. Requirements of a guest, I've got the amenities of the hotel, and now what we're doing is matching those things up. That results in really high density, uh, much higher density than you can get from manual basis. Lower service level risk, a compliance enforcement, and a cloud process automation system. So essentially the user doesn't know anything different about what's going on. It's just now there's an API call that's coming in. We're coming back and, and basically saying here's the best place for it to run. The other thing that's really important is the fact that if those workloads aren't coming online immediately, in a lot of cases test dev, you're going to spin them up right now. We see in the enterprise is more and more that request is saying for you know 30 days from now, send me uh, you know spin up 25 of these things. So the ability to actually route to the right place, but not only that, but reserve the capacity, the storage, and the CPU uh, in order to make sure that when those things do come online, that the capacity is available for them. It's not just self-service requests. It's also other types of onboarding into the environment. So you've got enterprise application deployments. So new applications coming online, not just from uh, people that are asking for them from the portal, but new apps that are being created. Uh, migrations and consolidations. A lot of customers we're talking to are moving off one hypervisor, one platform, and moving into OpenStack KVM. So the, uh, the idea that I've got a whole bunch of workloads coming on board at one time. And other existing applications may be moving from a legacy virtual environment. So those are all examples of inbound requests. Some of the challenges with this is the fact that cloud stacks don't really manage the existing workloads. They, they just start new ones. So there's no predictive element of what's going on, what's going to happen when you put these workloads on board. No reservation capability, no future infrastructure modeling, and no rerouting and analysis. So if you're moving from one environment to the next. So those are big challenges that exist today as you uh, take these other types of workloads and onboard them. So again, the same kind of thing will happen. When we can do this and actually route to the different environments, enterprise-wide routing, not just for OpenStack KVM, but for the other hypervisors and, and environments as well. A true capacity reservation system that actually holds the reservation for the workloads that are coming on board. External hybrid modeling, and really this, this whole uh, concept of automation, really without changing the way the customer sees this process working. On the reservation console, so the way it looks from a software perspective, and again, if you want to see this, and I'm going to demo s the software here up, up front here in the next uh, nine minutes, uh, but you can come and have a look at it, is essentially the, the request looks like this. So the new onboarded applications come in through the, uh, the environment. They show up as new guests coming on with, with specific time frames. Some of them will be spun up immediately. Some of them are ones that are scheduled to come on board, say, in whatever, 15, 30 days, what have you. On the right-hand side are all the different infrastructure groups, availability zones in the case of OpenStack, which says, you know, here's the workloads that are coming on, and here's the environments that are best suited for these things, as well as the environments that rejected them. And they might have rejected them because there's no available space in those environments, or it might be because that the amenities don't match. Someone needs a certain tier of storage, someone needs customer data running in a certain secure environment, and those things don't match. And so the software, again, from an intelligent routing perspective, will figure out what's the best place to, s to do these things. Send that infrastructure back, or the, uh, the information back uh, to the provisioning engine. This, deal t this detail diagram gets you into, you know, probably more details than I want to get to, but what I wanted to show you was the fact that th there's a whole process for the demand management. So we call this a swim lane diagram. So at the bottom of this diagram is really the ongoing supply, so the virtual and physical infrastructure, 
understanding what's there. That's what we call supply optimization. That's what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. The process flow looks like this. So when a new demand is initiated, someone asks for new applications to be spun up. Essentially, from a user perspective, they don't see anything different. They initiate the routing of demand. That calls us through our API. We do our analytics, figure out the best place to route and reserve that capacity. Sorry, so the demand routing happens. We look at the outstanding reservations, forecast the supply and demand, and then route that demand to the right place. The reservation is created, so if it's not being spun up immediately, if it is, then obviously we continue on with the provisioning process. Uh, if, if it's coming on board in a future date, then we create that reservation in the hosting location and lock in the capacity and take it away from the existing supply. That API goes back in, the reservation is confirmed to the user, and again, they don't notice anything different. It's just like, yeah, you got your 10 VMs are coming on board at that future date. When that day comes, uh, whether it's on demand or in the future, the provisioning execution occurs. We analyze the latest state of the bookings. We get the optimal placement. So it's not unlike a hotel. You came to the hotel, you made a reservation, you knew you were staying in a certain place. When you got there, they said, okay, you're staying in this room. So same kind of thing. It's like you're in this specific availability zone, but you're gonna be staying on this particular host. So we give that back, uh, back in through uh, the API, back to OpenStack for the provisioning process to initiate the provisioning and however you're going to do that. Provisioning is confirmed, it's completed. Requester understands and, and is uh, alerted that the uh, instance is now available. And then there's a reconciliation process that occurs to make sure that we've analyzed the latest state and any sort of a uh, reservation that kind of expired. So if someone said it was coming online and it never did come online, then we basically remove it from the queue. So just to kind of complete, you know, what we talked about here today is policy-based control, supply and demand management. Uh, we've been talking a lot today, and, and we just recently announced this whole integration, at least from uh, um, the hypervisor perspective with OpenStack and KVM on the supply side optimization. We already had the integration uh, with the Nova scheduler on the demand side. This technology works not just with, um, what is it, uh, KVM environments, but obviously Hyper-V, Power VM, Red Hat, and, and VMware across the compute, network storage, and the software analysis, and then working with the cloud management platforms, OpenStack, and the rest of them um, to do the actual work. So we think of ourselves as kind of a brain, and we talk to arms and legs and, and get monitoring information from the eyes and ears. So this is kind of the complete fit, and this is where we kind of see ourselves between hypervisors and resources and the cloud management platform. The final slide I had was really the benefits and why people are doing this today. So when you can do this with intelligent analytics, the average increase in density that we've seen uh, in our traditional customer base is, is upwards of almost 50% VM density, which results on an average savings around 48% on the hardware side. And the software license savings, when you can intelligently place where these workloads go and minimize where they're actually going to run, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 55%. Obviously, mileage may vary. Um, but that's what you get when you actually are doing this, this whole Tetris, packing workloads together safely, elimin eliminating risk, and increasing the density. So that reduces the capacity risk, increases the automation. We've got a few minutes left here, but uh, I'm going to close down the presentation. I could probably throw a rock right over to our, uh, our, our, our booth, which is right over here, if you wanted to come over, ask additional questions, uh, or see a demonstration. So thank you very much for your attention today and uh, have a good rest of the conference.